Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another Ground Rounds. Uh, today, we have Dr. Mas Marina Bassina, a world-renowned endocrinologist and professor of endocrinology from Stanford University, joining us to talk about adrenal insufficiency. So she was with us a few weeks ago where we talked about DKA and HHS. So it's a pleasure to have you back with us to discuss adrenal insufficiency. With over two decades of experience in the field of diabetes research and clinical care, Dr. Bessina is recognized as an expert in her field. Her research focuses on improving the management of diabetes and developing new therapies for the disease. She has published numerous papers in top medical journals and spoken at various international and domestic conferences. Dr. Bessina is also actively involved in educating the next generation of physicians and researchers in the field of endocrinology. Her dedication to advancing the understanding and the treatment of diabetes has earned her recognition and lead, making her a leading expert in the field. So we are, as usual, very, very grateful and excited to have you with us today on this discussion on adrenal insufficiency. All right, thank you so much for a great introduction. And it's morning here, we're um, in California. So good morning, everyone on my side. And I'm, it's a pleasure um, to give the talk. So I'm gonna share my slides. Um, so our topic today will be adrenal insufficiency and its management, diagnosis and management. So I'm going to start with the case presentation. So you got a call from emergency department regarding a 52-year-old woman with a one-month history of fatigue, weakness, and dizziness, and a one-week history of nausea, vomiting, and decreased appetite. The emergency department physician reports that she looks ill. Her blood pressure is 105 over 70, um, and her pulse is 94. She is vomiting repeatedly, and on the abdominal examination, she has diffuse tenderness, but no guarding or rebound. Um, you got her laboratory test results. Her sodium is low, 124. Her potassium is uh, slightly elevated, 5.2. Her chloride, 110, bicarbonate, 20, so below normal, creatinine, 1.2, and um, serum urea, nitrogen, 24. The emergency department physician is concerned about her adrenal function, and he has already initiated intravenous fluids and wants to give her hydrocortisone but he is asking you for the advice regarding which additional tests to order before initiating steroid therapy. <clears throat> I'll ask um, multiple choice questions and you'll feel free to jump in where I would just uh, answer with uh, my talk later on. <clears throat> so which of the following is the best diagnostic test to order now? ACTH and cortisol. Cortisol measurement 30 minutes after administration of 250 micrograms of clocentropin, salivary cortisol, aldosterone, and renin, or cortisol measurement and assessment of the 21 hydroxylase antibodies. So I guess I'll answer the question, which is, so the answer is A. So we it's best to get random ACTH and cortisol and if there is any suspicion then to initiate the treatment. Um, so I'll give you some history of adrenal insufficiency. Dr. Thomas Addison from Guy's Hospital in London described 11 cases in 1856. They described patients with lassitude, fatigue, weight loss, and skin hyperpigmentation. Adrenal insufficiency was invariably fatal until 1949, so not that long ago, when cortisone was first time synthesized and glucocorticoid replacement treatment became available for those patients. Studies on epidemiology of adrenal crisis give picture of uh, the incidence somewhere between five and 10 adrenal crisis per 100 patient a year 
in um, uh, patients who are already on standard replacement therapy for adrenal insufficiency. So if we divide the causes of adrenal insufficiency, we can divide them by primary, secondary, and tertiary. So for primary adrenal insufficiency, autoimmune Addison's disease described by Dr. Addison, as I mentioned, uh, could be a part of a, um, APS, which stands for autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 2, or could be just isolated um, autoimmune deficiency with, um, with Addison's. So frequency 80 to 90% in Western countries and 20 to 30% in developed countries. So APS1 or autoimmune polyglandular syndrome 1 is pretty rare. And um, this syndrome consists of adrenal insufficiency, hypoparathyroidism, and mucocutaneous candidiasis. Um, Post-tuberculosis addisons, um, adrenal leukodystrophy, which is an X-linked genetic, uh, also pretty rare. Uh, Post-mycotic infection and other forms. Uh, for secondary adrenal insufficiency, um, the Causes could be from space occupying lesion or trauma to the pituitary gland. Um, it could be from the tumors, adenomas, cysts, craniopharyngiomas, one of the most common ones, and ependymomas. I mean, angiomas are pretty rare and carcinomas are very rare. Or trauma that can affect either pituitary or pituitary stock. With that, they will, um, with those conditions, the cosyntropin or um, corticotropin or ACTH level would be low. And manifestations would be both anterior and posterior pituitary hormone deficiencies. Pituitary surgeries or irradiation to pituitary tumors um, also uh, the cause uh, of the space occupying lesion for secondary adrenal insufficiency, again, come with the low ACTH level. Um, infectious and infiltrative process um, are pretty common. I would say lymphocytic hypophysitis is the most common form. And we see mostly this condition in uh, usually postpartum, hemochromatosis to be tuberculosis, meningitis, and sarcoid. And again, comes with low corticotropin secretion. Uh, pit, uh, pituitary apoplexy, um, which can happen acutely in um, underlying adenoma that was not diagnosed prior to apoplexy. Again, ACTH level will be low. And Sheehan syndrome, which is a peripartum pituitary apoplexy and necrosis, again, ACTH level would be low. And women usually present with peripartum with abrupt onset of very severe headache, visual uh, disturbances, nausea and vomiting, all the signs and symptoms of adrenal crisis. And then finally, tertiary adrenal insufficiency also could be from occupying lesions or trauma, but affecting CRH, which is the corticotropin releasing hormone secretion. So those would be tumors higher up than pituitary gland. So those would be hypothalamic, again, craniopharyngioma, metastatic disease from lung cancer, breast cancer, hypothalamic injury or irradiation for CNS, uh, for a central, um, central nervous system, nasopharyngeal tumors. Again, all of those would present with low CRH levels, similar to secondary infectious and infiltrative processes and trauma or injury, including uh, that involving this base uh, of the skull. Uh, for drug-induced adrenal insufficiency, which is the most common one that we see, and most commonly we see with systemic administration of steroids for a longer period of time, also um, for endogenous uh, glucocorticoid hypersecretion with Cushing's and Cushing's uh, being cured or removed. Um, so the rest of the um, so the, it takes a lot of time and sometimes may not be complete recovery of the um, hypothalamic pituitary and adrenal access. Again, those would present with low corticotropin-releasing hormone and low ACTH. 
And some of the antipsychotic medications such as chlorpromazine or antidepressants such as mipramine with a high dose and with a long-term use cause inhibition of the glucocorticoid-induced gene transcription and with that also tertiary adrenal sufficiency. Uh, also, the medications that are increasing glucocorticoid uh, bioavailability and making sort of a creating the hyper um, adrenal state, uh, but with the removal of those medications would be um, manifestations of adrenal insufficiency. So those are inhibitors that um, inhibit the CYP3A4, the, um, the, which is the pathway for degradation of the glucocorticoids. So this would be reduction of the glucocorticoid clearance. So Again, even with um, if we give a small dose of glucocorticoid, then patients at the same time taking the medications that are inhibiting the degradation that create a higher blood level of the steroids. So medications are um, amiodarone, cyclosporine, verapamil, itraconazole, and several uh, other antiviral medications. And grape juice, um, I've never seen it's reported, but I've never seen uh, one. And also long-term use of hypothalamic pituitary axis suppressant, such as the opioids. So patients who have long-term use of the opioids in a high doses, we do see secondary and tertiary adrenal insufficiency. Um, so what are the symptoms? Uh, frequently, it's very challenging to diagnose because there could be symptoms overlap with various conditions. So this is the picture of the example with the infection of um, you know, pneumonia or uh, polymyalgia rheumatica. Um, so, but if patient has some sort of stressor such as any infection that can induce acute adrenal insufficiency. So other predisposition um, for development adrenal insufficiency would be personal or individual glucocorticoid sensitivity, thyroid and growth hormone levels, other comorbid conditions, and medications affecting, as we mentioned, metabolism of glucocorticoids and formation of the cortisol binding globulins. Uh, for a, acute adrenal insufficiency or adrenal crisis, it is one of the medical emergencies, one of the, I would say, few medical emergencies um, and in endocrinology. Um, so any kind of stress normally increases the production of the CRH, corticotropin-releasing hormone, then ACTH from pituitary and subsequent the production of the cortisol. As cortisol level increase, it sends a negative feedback and reduces the whole um, stimulation of the whole system. Um, so CRH uh, with the vasopressin usually stimulate the release of the ACTH. So again, any stress, physical stress, running marathon or taking board exams, uh, with emotional stress, low blood sugar, cold exposure, severe pain can precipitate adrenal crisis. Um, other causes and factors that can precipitate adrenal crisis, as we said, infections of stress. It can present as shock in someone who was previously undiagnosed with um, adrenal insufficiency and subjected to major stress. It could also be in patients with known adrenal insufficiency not being able to take sufficient amount of steroids. Bilateral adrenal hemorrhage, it's rare, uh, or infarction. Um, so it would be either hemorrhage or emboli. Sepsis classically described with pseudomonas um, like for many decades, or adrenal vein thrombosis after back injury, for example, or surgery. Other uh, major risk factors would be the anticoagulant therapy for the hemorrhage, coagulopathy, and post-operative state. Pituitary apoplexy or infarction would present with severe headache, acute visual loss, and reduction of the visual fields. Um, so what is the definition for adrenal crisis? Um, major impairment of general health with at least two of the following signs or symptoms. 
hypotension defined as systolic blood pressure less than 100, nausea and vomiting, severe fatigue, fever, somnolence, hyponatremia, usually with sodium less than 132, or hyperkalemia, which usually we see in primary adrenal insufficiency and not that much in secondary, hypoglycemia. Parental glucocorticoid administration needed to be done uh, immediately, and administration follows immediate clinical improvement. So that would be one of the signs. Clinical and laboratory testing, patients would present with dehydration, hypotension, shock that is out of proportion to severity of the current illness. Nausea and vomiting are common with a history of weight loss and anorexia for some period of time. Abdominal pain, so-called acute abdomen, unexplained hypoglycemia. Interestingly, that it's more commonly when it's uh, secondary ACTH deficiency that's causing the adrenal um, crisis. Unexplained fevers, especially low-grade fevers are pretty common. From the lab uh, test, as we said, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, azotemia, eosinophilia. So this is eosinophilia actually is a very good um, indicator and marker of steroid deficiency, because as we know, we give glucocorticoids for allergies, right? For asthma, for allergies. So if the eosin, so they suppress eosinophil. So if eosinophil levels is high, that's one of your signs that a patient may have steroid deficiency. Hyperpigmentation or vitiligo would be um, vitiligo as a part of the autoimmune uh, complex. Other autoimmune condition um, and deficiencies such as hypothyroidism or gonadal failure. Um, so I, I hope you can see it on the picture, but this is sort of a um, hands a hyperpigmentation. Um, so most commonly you would look uh, at the cases would be palmar creases in the knuckles. Um, so those would be the most commonly obvious areas. Also, you can see it around the mouth and in the cheeks. Um, um, sorry if the pictures don't come uh, very clear. So confirmation of the diagnosis should not delay the institution of treatment. And that's why in our case, uh, remember <clears throat> from our patient, we are uh, sending random cortisol level and then we initiated the treatment. Now, short-term uh, or short ACTH stimulation test can be performed still uh, even after we initiate steroid therapy um, because glucocorticoid therapy has not been given for more than two days, does not suppress the axis enough and does not preclude us doing the test. Neither hydrocortisone nor cortisone converted to cortisol in the liver. And if we give steroids that are not um, measured as cortisol in the blood, then we can still test. So classically, we give dexamethasone, dose of dexamethasone, if we're uh, planning on doing the glucentropin stim test. Treatment of the crisis, um, emergency measures would be establishing IV access with a large gauze, a gauge needle, draw the blood and start for stats, serum electrolytes and glucose, draw uh, blood for cortisol and ACTH, like we did in our patients, do, do not wait for the results, initiate the treatment, um, infuse two to three liters of normal saline or 5% um, dextrose, monitor for signs uh, of, of fluids uh, with overload and reduce infusion as indicated. Other emergency measures um, give four milligrams of dexamethasone intravenously. It's preferred for two reasons. One, because it's a long lasting for 12 to 24 hours, and it does not interfere with the measurement of serum or urinary steroids during subsequent stimulation tests if we, if we decide to do confirmatory testing. Hydrocortisone also may be given, for example, in someone who has known adrenal insufficiency and uh, comes in with adrenal crisis, we usually give 100 milligrams intravenously of hydrocortisone um, and then uh, repeat this dose every six to eight hours for the first 24 hours and then reduce. 
mineral corticoid replacement or fludrocortisone does not need to be used. Uh, for subacute measures, uh, we continue intravenous saline with a slowing rate to make sure a patient does not develop um, congestive heart failure or fluid overload. Search for possible um, infectious precipitating causes and treat. You can perform a CTH stimulation test, as we said, to confirm diagnosis um, and um, for, and then look for the cause. Taper steroids for maintenance dose over one to three days or as patient condition allows, and then begin medical, mineral corticoid replacement when saline infusion stopped in case of primary adrenal insufficiency. Also, I um, just want to add to here, if we give hydrocortisone, then uh, if the dose is 40 or higher, it's enough to cover mineral corticoid access, so we don't have to give mineral corticoids. If we treat with dexamethasone, so dexamethasone does not have mineral corticoid activity, so then we consider adding mineral corticoids if needed. Um, so for the prevention of crisis, uh, the recommendations are um, to use, so first knowing the dose equivalence that one milligram of dexamethasone equals to four to five milligrams of solumedrol or methylprednisolone that we use in the hospital, or five milligrams of dexamethasone, oh, prednisone, or 20 to 25 milligrams of hydrocortisone. For exceptional activities um, like strenuous um, hikes, stressful university board exams, uh, we give extra five to 10 milligrams. In addition, for example, a patient known um, has history of adrenal insufficiency, we advise those patients to take five to 10 milligrams of hydrocortisone one to two hours before starting off the physical activity or exam. For moderate stress, flu-like infections, surgical procedures, local anesthesia, double the dose of the usual steroid dose until recovery, which can last two to four days. For severe stress or such as medical, major surgery with general anesthesia or trauma, give 100 to 150 milligrams IV of hydrocortisone over 24 hours, and then continue with 50 to 100 milligrams IV every eight hours for two to four days, and then taper depending on the patient's clinical performance. Um, for, um, so this is sort of a summary table for the um, prevention of crisis. Again, lists some more conditions that we've just discussed. So interestingly, that labor and vaginal birth. Um, so patients who have adrenal sufficiency and pregnant, we don't have to replace steroids. We replace the usual dose steroids, but we do not increase the dose of steroids until um, kind of either uh, middle of third trimester or close to the labor, to the delivery. Um, so during delivery, we do give the hydrocortisone infusion as a stress dose at the onset of the labor. And then we've discussed uh, the procedures such as uh, major and minor uh, uh, procedures. So for dental procedures, if patient has a significant procedure, so let's say um, the implants, then we give a stress dose of steroids. Um, for in um, bowel prep procedures requiring um, laxatives, hospital usually administers um, admis admits patient overnight and gives 100 milligram of hydrocortisone um, to out <coughs> before the procedure, and then. Again, for dental procedure, just regular procedure or a root canal, um, then give morning dose uh, extra, so double the morning dose an hour before the surgery. Um, some special circumstances which come uh, quite often in clinic. Um, so patients ask, if I work night times, how do I manage my steroids? So for the shift workers, change according to their schedule. So take a larger dose of hydrocortisone on waking up in the whenever time they wake up, let's say they wake up at 7 p.m. to go to work. 
And then second dose takes six, six to eight hours uh, later after the first dose. And then patients will come home, fall, uh, go to uh, take a nap or take uh, uh, get their sleep and then uh, take steroids later again. Again, we just talked about pregnancy. Um, so again, glucocorticoids um, in the third trimester because of the increase of the Cortico, uh, binding glob, cortisol binding globulins and total cortisol level will be high, but free cortisol level might be on a low side. So consider increase by in the third trimester, increasing by 20 to 40% of the total daily dose of the glucocorticoids. For pregnancy for mineral corticoids, consider change in the last trimester only. Again, continue the same dose of fluorinaf or flutocortisone throughout the pregnancy and make the change in the last trimester because progesterone has an um, anti-mineral corticoid activity. In monitor for sodium and potassium level, renin usually physiologically increased during pregnancy so do not monitor the level. Uh, prolonged intense exercise. Um, give small carb meal before exercise. Make sure patients get salt replacement and um, I'll go give 2.5 to five milligrams every three to four hours of hydrocortisone um, during the marathon, for example. For the hot environment, uh, advise patient to take additional salt or salty foods. Consider increasing mineral corticoids by 50 to 100 micrograms. For patients who are on dialysis and have adrenal insufficiency, you can stop their fluidocortisone mineral corticoids. Hydro glucocorticoid dose, the um, hydrocortisone of prednisone dose, may need to be increased because some of the medication lost during hemodialysis. And patients who are, have hypertension uh, on calcium channel blockers would be the preferred therapy for hypertension. ACE inhibitors and ARB are less effective in patients with adrenal insufficiency. Um, so in terms of the critical illness, um, so cortisol uh, mediates and enhances action of angiotensin II, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and it maintains cardiovascular or cardiac contractility, vascular tone, and maintain, maintenance of the blood pressure. So AC, during the stress or during the critical illness, um, ACTH level initially gets elevated, but then after the first four to five days, the level significantly falls because of all the cytokines um, with the acute illness or inflammation or infection. Um, and cortisol remains elevated due to other factors such as increased production and decreased degradation as happens um, sort of the to save or to uh, reflex of the body to physio physiologically increase the amount of cortisol. Um, so there are some difficulties in measurements in uh, cortisol and assessment of the cortisol level during cortical illness. So the basal level of cortisol will be elevated already because body will be stressed at its maximum level. ACTH level, would be constantly elevated because it will try to stimulate the cortisol level as much as possible. Low cortisol binding globulins makes total cortisol level that we usually measure, right? Free cortisol levels assays are not readily available and we just measure the total cortisol, which the level could be falsely low and could be unreliable if the globulins are low. Um, so for critical illness, if the guidelines are that if the patient, if you have um, a patient with who you suspect adrenal uh, crisis or adrenal insufficiency, if patient is hemodynamically stable, sorry, it's, a, it's specifically for patient with sepsis. So if patient is hemodynamically unstable, patient has septic shock, 
So if yes, initiate higher cortisol, higher cortisol in those who you already had given enough fluids, but blood pressure remains elevated. And that should be regardless of the cortisol level. If patient is stable, then draw random cortisol level and you can initiate hydrocortisone therapy in those who are hemodynamically unstable, even while awaiting for the cortisol test results. So now in terms of the interpretation of the cortisol level uh, in the setting of the low albumin, so the recommendations from the, um, in, from the critical care society is um, if albumin is over 2.5 gram per deciliter, treat with hydrocortisone if rain of cortisol level less than 15. If albumin is less than 2.5, um, treat with hydrocortisone if random cortisol level less than 10, or if you happen to measure free cortisol level, then it would be less than 1.8. So you can consider corticotropic stimulating test in selected patients with borderline and low cortisol level if situation allows. Uh, for sepsis international guidelines uh, for management of severe sepsis and sepsis shock, um, the recommendations are to administer glucocorticoid therapy irrespective of cortisol level if adequate fluid resuscitation and vasopressin therapy are enabled to restore hemodynamic instability. Uh, hemodynamic stability. So again, um, this recommendations just wanted to point out because we do get a lot of those consults in the hospital. Uh, for various conditions. Those recommendations and studies were done in septic patients, not in other conditions. So with the surge of the cytokines and with cytokines effect on the HPA axis. So it may not apply to other conditions and sepsis only. This is what, um, again, what the data that we have. So we don't know if we can extrapolate it to other conditions. So in terms of the um, relative adrenal insufficiency, so this term has been used a lot in the literature and how do we diagnose it um, and how do we manage it? Because as we mentioned, we already ha may have maximally stimulated cortisol production uh, by the adrenals. And if we stimulate, if we, how do we assess adequacy of the response? Um, so, so there are a lot of debates in the literature about the uh, terminology of does relative adrenal insufficiency exist and how do we interpret cosentropin stimulation test. So the positive studies show that yes, it does exist and it um, show an increase in mortality in, in septic shock um, with relative adrenal insufficiency. Other study published in JAMA should have looked at 299 patients with septic shock showed that there was a decreased mortality if we use glucocorticoid replacement if delta on the cosentropin test is less than nine microgram per deciliter. So meaning that um, if we the level is already 20 to begin with, it's really high. And we give the and we administer cosentropin stimulation test. Is our test comes back as let's say twenty five, less than nine. So those patients in the study receive glucocorticoid replacement. Um, criticism of that paper was that patients uh, who had low data actually received etomidate. Etomidate is an anesthetic agent that reduces the cortisol production. So there were negative studies. So the um, the landmark study called Cortico study. So that was published in New England Journal in 2008. It was a multi-center, double-blinded, placebo-controlled study, including large number, relatively large patient number of patients, almost 500 patients, who were randomized to hydrocortisone, administered every six hours for five days with taper and placebo. So there was no difference in mortality, 3.3 um, days in patients who were treated with uh, glucocorticoids and 3.9 days without, and there was no significant differences. Now in patients who um, 
have received the steroids had higher incidence of superinfection, new sepsis and sepsis shock. So the recommendations was not to give it. And then additional paper published also in um, 2006 in a Journal of Clinical Endocrinology of Metabolism showed that one third of unstressed controls. So if when if we take normal controls with no history of adrenal insufficiency in the hospital, they may already have um, delta less than nine, so may not be characteristic of uh, adrenal insufficiency. So interestingly, in 2018, there were two studies came out and published in the same issue of New England Journal. Um, so one study looked at adjunct therapy uh, of, with glucocorticoids for septic shock. So patients were on mechanical ventilation. Um, there was quite a large number of patients. Um, and they were randomized to receive glucocorticoids with a pretty high dose, 200 milligrams IV for seven days or until discharge from ICU or death. And patients who were on placebo. Primary outcome was death from any cause at 90 days. So as you can see, um, the two lines were absolutely parallel or close running um, together. So there was no difference in um, death outcomes for patients who were are given or not given of the um, steroids. Um, so for the subgroup analysis of the death within 90 days, uh, so patients who did get better in the hydrocortisone uh, where when the time from shock onset to randomization uh, was lower, uh, but otherwise there was not significantly different for any of the other um, parameters. Now um, in the same paper, in the same journal, same issue, another paper came out um, giving fludrocortisone with hydrocortisone and um, drug, um, another um, like activated alpha um, draw um, draw uh, uh, draw um, So there were uh, 1,200 patients and it was double-blinded randomized control study. So this paper actually did show benefit with hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone. Um, and it was statistically significant for probability of the survival in the case of the shock. Um, so also there was significant difference in the time of weaning from the, of the ventilator. So with uh, favoring of treatment with glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids, uh, probability of freedom from mechanical ventilation also statistically significant. And the SOFA scores or the scores of the patient's conditions also were improved with both um, medications being given. Um, so again, um, jury is still out there. So we still um, not have a very good data, but uh, based on the results, uh, patients who are with sepsis and suspected rel relative adrenal insufficiency still kind of standard of care in at least our ICU that the uh, treatment is given. So what about the free cortisol measurement in critical illness? So usually 90% of the cortisol is protein bound and 70% tightly bound to cortisol binding globulins and 10 to 20% loosely to albumin. And that small fraction is ready to being able to um, be released into the circulation if needed. So there's no consensus of the measurement of the uh, free cortisol level. The, it usually takes quite a long time for the result to come back. Um, so the level 1.3 to 1.8 in critically ill patients, or if we give the stimulation test, cosentropin stimulation, over 3.1 um, is considered normal. Um, other proposed indices were calculated free cortisol, free cortisol index, uh, which are not, the validation has not been done for those tests. Um, so medications that can impair uh, adrenal access in critically ill patient. So glucocorticoids, either parental, oral, or topical, inhaled, or nasal, 
that are used with equivalent over five milligrams morning of prednisone or equivalent for more than three weeks, over two grams a day of high potency or super high potency topical glucocorticoids for more than two to three weeks, three or more intra-articular or spinal glucocorticoid injections within three months to prior to admission, and over 1,500 microgram per day of inhaled glucocorticoids, such as fluticasone, for more than three weeks prior to admission. So on those patients who suspect adrenal insufficiency when they get admitted, and those patients will have low AC CRH and ACTH secretion, uh, leading to low cortisol secretion. Antifungal medications such as ketoconazole, fluconazole to a lesser extent, can yeah. inhibit cortisol uh, synthesis at um, several different steps of the cortisol production. You know that ketoconazole we give for treatment of hypercortisolism for patients with Cushing's. Megase that uh, in the hospital used for uh, increasing the appetite. So it may decrease CRH and ACTH secretion and um, lead to secondary adrenal insufficiency. Other medications, um, aminoglutetamide, um, atomidate, as I mentioned, inhibit cortisol production. Um, actually, the Atomidate story was first described with um, at Stanford uh, uh, by one of our wonderful um, endocrinologists who is now retired, uh, Dr. David Feldman, and the fellows who were working with him at that time. Um, other medications, phenobarbital, phenytoin, and rifampin, increase cortisol metabolism. Antifungulants, tyrosine kinase inhibitors may cause adrenal or pituitary hemorrhage. And mifepristone is the medications for use for medical abortion. And also the other name for this medicine is Corlim that we used for Cushing disease treatment. It's a competitive inhibitor of glucocorticoid receptor. So also can cause adrenal insufficiency. So let's go over another case, just as an example. So you are consulted regarding a 74-year-old man in orthopedic unit four days after left hip replacement. The patient reported severe left flank discomfort for 24 hours and abdominal CT um, performed. We won't see the image, but... Um, it uh, showed uh, bilateral adrenal enlargement. His uh, medical team now seeks your consultation, and you have been a uh, patient has been ambul ambulatory since the surgery, but his appetite has been poor, and he has trouble adhering to the physical therapy program. He has a history of well-controlled hypertension for many years, but his post-operative um, medications include acetaminophen with codeine, amlodipine, and low molecular weight heparin. On physical exam, his blood pressure 126 over 70, pulse 110. He's a febrile. Um, his BMI is 29. He has truncal obesity, but does not appear cushingoid. He has no hyperpigmentation. His thyroid gland is normal. His findings on chest and cardiac examination um, are remarkable only for a rapid regular um, heartbeat. Um, and his abdomen um, is soft, Sorry. Um, but there is some guarding to palpation in the left flank. He has no edema and no other neurological findings. Um, so actually, the, we do have the CT scan. So uh, you can see this huge left adrenal gland, and you can see um, somewhat enlarged the right adrenal gland. So we got his laboratory test. So which ones would be consistent with his condition? Um, so normal sodium, low potassium, 
uh, cortisol elevated, ACTH elevated, and aldosterone um, you know, kind of lowish. Um, sodium low, potassium elevated, cortisol low, ACTH significantly elevated, and aldosterone on the low side. Patient could have hypernatremia, normal, potassium, high, low cortisol level, lowish ACTH, and normal aldosterone. Uh, norma, um, sodium normal, normal potassium, um, cortisol elevated 46, ACTH kind of normal, low normal, and um, the uh, aldosterone low. Or uh, hyponatremia, normal kalemia, low cortisol, the um, ACTH undetectable, and um, and aldosterone normal. So um, let's go over the so um, the uh, so our correct answer is um, uh, B, right? Because patient has. Um, adrenal insufficiency with bilateral adrenal hemorrhage, um, which we talk, discussed previously, uh, can be associated with um, orthopedic surgeries or any or any also any abdominal surgeries. So acute hemorrhage uh, to the adrenal was initially identified um, in association with fulminant meningococcemia uh, called uh, water Fredrickson syndrome. But this event now is extremely rare, but it does is it was seen in patients with history of thromboembolic disease and recent surgery requiring therapeutic or prophylactic anticoagulation, coagulopathies such as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or antiphospholipid syndrome associated with lupus anticoagul syndrome, also well appreciated cause. Pain of vari variable severity in the abdomen, flank, lower back pain, and chest would be the presentation. And there are usually not too many clues on physical exam except low-grade fever. Interestingly, hypotension is usually a late finding and usually um, heralding the onset of catastrophic shock that can be mistaken for septic shock. Um, in the setting of the bilateral adrenal hemorrhage. So for our case presentation, we said that B was the right answer where a patient had the primary adrenal insufficiency with low sodium, high potassium, and elevated ACTH level. Um, so the mechanisms associated with adrenal hemorrhage are multifactorial. Each adrenal gland has only one vein and any rise in the venous pressure with or without adrenal vein thrombosis creates sort of a vascular dam in the presence of especially coagulopathy and uh, leads to possible hemorrhagic event. Stress with increased in adrenal blood flow may contribute to the pathogenesis and um, there's also ex, uh, eccentric muscular arrangement in the adrenal vein may uh, particularly be vulnerable for the formation of the platelets uh, thrombi in the blood vessel, especially because of the, if the event of blood flow turbulence or stasis. Um, so I think I'm going to skip that um, just for the sake of time. So to see if we have any questions, I can see some questions in the chat. I'm going to stop share. Let me look at the chat. Um, can we get access to this PowerPoint? Sure, I'll be more than happy to share the slides. Is there a limit uh, cut off for um, hyperkalemia defined as acute adrenal insufficiency? No, there's no real cutoff. Um, and the, 
the, the levels could be very variable, but usually we don't see the levels in the like sixes or above six. I don't, I have not seen those. Usually the levels would be in the fives, like from 5.3 to 5.8 or six. Those are the most commonly one. And I can see that um, somebody answered B and that was the right answer. That was great. So I also can see some questions in the chat. Um, why mineral corticoid not given acutely sodium electrolytes imbalance of taking care immediately? Yeah, so a one is the reason, that's a great question. So one is the reason that um, usually we give IV fluids with the steroid, with um, uh, electrolyte replacement. Um, and also, as I mentioned that hydrocord, if we give replace with hydrocortisone, hydrocortisone has mineral, cortic mineral corticoid activity. And be with the stress doses, as we give 100 milligrams, we get plenty of mineral corticoid activity by using hydrocortisone. So when we taper steroid dose and hydrocortisone dose get to 40 milligrams or lower, then the mineral corticoid activity would be insufficient. And at that point, uh, we would need to give uh, to, re to start mineral corticoids. Okay, thank you. Yes, I think you covered all the questions that I saw in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, so that's good. And then Cameron, if there's any questions from you all over there as well, we're happy to take them right now. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much, Dr. Vasinitz, for talking and uh, sharing management approach to adrenal insufficiency. It's definitely one of those more challenging topics. So it was really nice to get this breakdown and how to manage it with all the various dosages. Sure. And uh, I think one of the chat, can I share my email? Yes. yes. So I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, Yeah, feel free to um, message me and um, I'm happy to share the slides. And thank Hello, you. Hello, Dr. Basina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, first of all, I want to extend our greetings and our thanks here from Cameroon for what was an excellent talk. There was so much to learn from it, but the way it was beautifully explained actually made it easy and easy to digest. So we are thankful for that and really eager to go through it again once it's uploaded by Health for the Wall. I had a few concerns about, uh, about adrenal insufficiency, a few questions I had, and I'm glad to tell you that most of these concerns were answered already during your talk. One was about uh, low levels of albumin and CBG in critically ill patients and how we should do in our context where we can only measure total cortisol. But I think uh, it was already addressed with the varying degrees at, or thresholds at which we are going to administer steroids, is depending on the albumin level. So that was really good. So thank you about that. The other concern I had, which was already addressed as well, was about sepsis and septic shock. Now, should we do we need to test actually in patients with sepsis and septic shock? Do we actually need to test for adrenal insufficiency or just go ahead and give it? And our practice actually has been to go ahead and give it without necessarily testing. And if I understood that correctly, that is actually what is recommended. Do you confirm that? Um, yeah, so great question. Um, so the recommendations are, like we said, regardless of the cortisol level. I, um, I think the recommendations are still to measure the level just to get an idea of what the level is. For example, if their level is low in setting of sepsis, then you would suspect that the patient had underlying adrenal insufficiency maybe before coming into the hospital, right? So if the level is high, then it would be difficult to interpret. But regardless of the level, if patient is hemodynamically unstable, despite your giving or treating with adequate amount of fluids um, and um, patient still has significant requirements for pressors, then yes, regardless of the level, you would still give the, um, the glucocorticoid treatment but, uh, and to see if patient responds to, the, to that therapy. 
but I think it still would be very useful to measure cortisol level because if in the setting of stress, um, your the cortisol level comes back low, right? You would suspect that patient has condition that had, you know, underlying adrenal insufficiency before development of sepsis, and you would look for the causes, um, and you will have a different. Um, taper for those patients. So those patients may not be able to come off the steroids. You may need to continue steroids for a longer period of time. And then when patient is stable, then perform concentropin stimulation test. So yes, I would I'd say everyone has to have a cortisol level measured for this reason. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Vasina. Now, my last question was, the most common type of uh, renal insufficiency we encounter here in Cameroon is, uh, well, in bingo, when we see our patients, is tertiary adrenal insufficiency from drugs. So most of our patients auto-medicate with steroids, and they're present here with adrenal insufficiency because of that. Now, one of the main concerns I've personally had has been, how long do I offer them a taper regimen of steroid? How long do I need to go with that? And then how long before they recover? So how long am I going to need to give them pulse doses of steroids for stress events, for example? Um, so yeah, great question. I don't think there is a you know, very straightforward answer because it depends on the patient. Um, so you can <clears throat> give the, for a dialysis, for example, you can treat or you can give the some pulse dose of steroids if patient is sick or hemodynamically unstable or blood pressure is very low or patient cannot tolerate dialysis. But then um, in between, if you started it, so do the cosentropin stimulation test as soon as possible. So before you give enough steroids in, uh, to, um, to suppress adrenal access, also, you can do in between dialysis sessions, you can hold, if you're giving the hydrocortisone, which is a short acting steroids, you can hold the morning dose and you can check cortisol and ACTH simultaneously. If your ACTH is low in the setting of low cortisol or undetectable, then patient has adrenal insufficiency and you would just continue treatment. If ACTH level is elevated, then you can Team the patient, do the gosentropin steam test um, to see if patient has um, a normal response. And usually we would say take your previous dose or your uh, pre the, uh, the day before hydrocortisone, not later than three to four in the afternoon, then hold the morning dose, uh, do the test, and then take the medication until the results are back. Okay. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And thank you for great questions. Those are all great questions. And um, I think when we are in practice, uh, those questions come up all the time and not always so easy to answer. They're not always straightforward, of course. And uh, we're, so when in doubt, it's just give the steroids. And then, uh, so this is what we do in the hospital. If your suspicion is significant and if you are not able to perform the test for whatever reason, just give steroids and then uh, ask patient discharge then to do this STEM test as I described. Okay. Question from someone? Okay, I think that's all from Cameroon. Thank you once again. Oh, you're very welcome and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, thank you everyone. This is a really good session. We'll see you all next time.